Hello. Um, just a brief introduction maybe to the topic of my research and how I came to research this field. Um, I'm, engin I'm an engineer architect. I started to work as an architect and uh, building passive houses uh, in an office. Then I started to do research uh, on cavity wall insulation at university, then on thermal bridges, more the technical aspects. But what bothered me is that, actually troubled me, is we know quite a lot about building physics. But still, we, most of the time, we fail at doing quick and efficient estimation of real energy use and real energy savings. And that's what I wanted to investigate. And that's why I started my PhD research on energy renovation and occupant behavior, trying actually to see whether we could find an efficient way of estimating real energy savings in dwellings. This research is conducted now at uh, Ghent University, together with Flemish Institute for Technological Research, under uh, funding from the Research Foundation Flanders. So as a background, I think everybody knows, and it's the same in most of the countries in, in Europe, of at least, when we go up north, is in uh, Belgium we see that 75% of the energy use uh, in dwellings goes to space heating. And then to assess that, we have like calculation method. In Belgium we call them the EPB, EPC, EAP. Here apparently you call it the BER, um, DEAP. Um, if I'm informed correctly um, by discussions uh, this week, it's actually all based on the same method. It's the ISO standard 3790. Um, which is an international standard, and everybody uses it. It's actually widespread, it's compulsory, you have to use it. So we would think, okay, that's great, we have an estimation of the building and we can go on. But the problem is, and here I already show some results from further from the study, you see results from two different neighborhoods. On the right side you have an old neighborhood, on the left side a new neighborhood. On the base axis you find the calculated, estimated energy use for heating, and on the y-axis, you find the measured energy use. Normally, if everything was okay, we should be on this line, having a perfect agreement. Now, starting at the old neighborhood, the first thing we see is we have quite a variation. Those are nearly identical houses. I will come back to that later. But the first problem is we have an estimated spread in reality, because even though it, there were ne nearly identical houses, that some windows you placed and so on. But in reality, the spread is much higher. We don't have a spread of 50 kilowatt hours per square meter a year. We have a spread of, of more than 150. Second problem, the estimation itself. We think we are using about 330 kilowatt hours per square meter a year, but in reality, the average was about 150. Consequence, if we would compare two neighborhoods, we would think, okay, the theoretical gain is around 230 kilowatt hours per square meter a year by going to new standards, but in reality, we only saw a difference of about 75. And so that's a big problem. And the more problem is if you go not at the neighborhood level, but at the discrete level, if you, and you want to know for a certain household, how much is he going to gain from another renovation measure? Is he going to go, for example, the one who consumes a lot, is he going to go there? Or is he going to go there? It doesn't have to be linear. The other one, downstairs, may be even worse. He might actually increase his uses. It seems strange, but in Great Britain they have a few cases. So now the, the background the project is actually looking at the calculation method. Um, those ISO standards, they start from heat balance in houses. A heat balance energy use is actually simple ID. You have four main parameters. You have, first of all, the building envelope and the building techniques. And then you have the condition. You have the exterior boundary condition, the weather, the sun, the temperature. And you have the interior boundary condition, the set point temperature, the internal heat gains, and so on. And that is all within the calculation model. But to make it efficient, we use default values. Sometimes we overwrite it with detailed values. We use standardized averages, standardized climate, standardized user behavior, and so on. And that's the first cause of discrepancy. But another problem, I will come back to that later, there is an interaction. User behavior isn't the same in an old house as in a new house. So you can't start from static values if you want to do a real estimation. So while, and we discussed it this morning, um, someone mentioned it's okay for qualitative assessments, but it starts to fail when you want to use it for quantitative assessment and, for example, payback times. So the idea of, of the research is to go to a comprehensive approach on complementary, complementary case studies, looking at reality. First comprehensive approach, what do I mean by that, is we are not just looking at the user, we're not just looking at the building, we, use, we are looking at both and at the results. 
So we're looking at the building, the user, the performance, and we do that with measurements and surveys. For example, we measure the building air tightness. We even measure in the whole neighborhoods the real U values of buildings on site. We're able to do that. We measure some aspects on the user, for example, um, his presence uh, or his heating set point. We also measure performance, like energy use. But we also use surveys. We want to know when are they present, are they happy or not. So we have a huge set of data, and the main goal at the end is to know why do we have this discrepancy between reality and the models. Now we do that on complementary case studies. We don't do that on one neighborhood. We do that on, first of all, different neighborhoods of nearly identical houses. Why nearly identical? Because it's more easy to isolate uh, variation due to user behavior if the buildings are nearly identical, of course. And we do that on different neighborhoods, old neighborhoods, new neighborhoods, to be able to assess whether or not the conclusions from one neighborhood, for example, non-insulated houses, are also valid for insulated houses. And of course, we have different users. Within one neighborhood, we have different users, but actually, we also find that it's there is a link between the building and the user. It's correlated. For example, in old houses, we most of the time find or old people or uh, more poor people. So it's not that easy to find sets that cover the whole possible combinations. So it's quite hard. But I'm going to illustrate it to the first case study. It's an old housing neighborhood. You see here the, the master plan. It's, it's those black houses were to be analyzed. We had about I did 70 houses. And um, old social housing. To give an idea, this is uh, the plan of the house. On the ground floor, we have living room, kitchen, uh, toilet. On the first floor, we have the bedrooms and the bathroom. It's a fairly small house. It's about, I think, 80 uh, square meters. They're all nearly identical, all the houses. Uh, they have the same plan. Um, the only small difference is that sometimes someone replaced one window somewhere, for example. Um, for the rest, actually, it's almost the same. And they have, as only main heating, they have here one gas furnace in the living room and some additional electric heating in the bedrooms. So for example, ideas of what we measure is, for example, we measure air tightness. Because we don't want to use a default value in the calculation method, we want to know where does the method fit. So for example, here you see the air tightness of this neighborhood. We assumed identical houses, but we found air tightness changes, the N50 value, going from around 7 to around 30. Same neighborhood. We compare that to reference buildings. These are, these are ordered chronologically from old houses from the 80s in Belgium, from recent houses, 2010, passive houses. It's actually quite in line with the evolution of air tightness in Belgium. But we also measure the U value, because it, you can't know the U value of a wall just by looking at it. For example, here you have U values of four different houses. And we see that depending on where we measure it and in which house, we still have a variation between 1.2 and, and, and 1.6. It's, it's not negligible. But it's still in line with standard building practice. This is reference data I have from Belgium, from Cavity Wall Project. Old houses, for example, they have U values between 1.1 and 2.1. So of course, depending on which value you use, you will have totally different results. So we measure that also. The user, main source of information are the surveys. What do we ask? To this neighborhood of 33 houses, we ask who are their ages, uh, occupation uh, or disoccupation. Um, how do they use their building, for example? When are they present? Do they open their windows? Uh, when do they heat, etc.? We also ask, and that's very important, how do they feel about it? Do they appreciate uh, the comfort or not? Because it's not because you measure 23 degrees that they are hot enough. Sometimes they feel cold. And do they know what they're using? And also, what if? Imagine we would say to you, okay, we replace your windows. Would you change your way of opening the windows? All kinds of maybe silly questions, but it's very funny to, to see the answers. I, I won't go through all the questions because it's more than 20 pages of surveys that we ask to every single inhabitant, but I will show some of the main influential aspects. For example, we can look at presence in different rooms. Here you see a daily profile. 24 hours from midnight to midnight for the different rooms in the house. Left is our neighborhood and right is um, reference data for Belgium. The most important is red are the bedrooms, of course, at night. Most of the people, but not all the people, do sleep. And we see that there are a lot of people present in the living room during the day. 
That is because it's mainly social housing. We had a lot of old retired people or uh, unemployed people. So if we compare that to reference data, of course, we have different figures during the day. But presence actually doesn't mean that much on, on heat consumption. What you want to know is when do they heat? And that's interesting to compare both. On the green line here, you see the probability of presence in the living room going up, of course, during the day. And here you see the probability of heating the living room on this, in this neighborhood. And you see quite a good correlation, but with a big difference that some people continue to heat even though they're not there during night. On the contrary, you see that the other rooms aren't heated at all, almost not, except a little bit the bedrooms just before going to sleep or the bathroom while taking a shower. I'll come back to that when we take into consideration assumption in the calculation method. But you go get further and ask yourself, OK, but what about ventilation? So we look at what do they say about opening the windows? <laughs> and then we see, for example, they heat the living room during the day, but they don't open the windows in the living room. So the heated room is almost not actively, passively ventilated. On the contrary, the bedrooms, are quite a lot more people ventilate the bedroom, but when they're not present. So they ventilate the least heated rooms when they're not present and not heating it. So bear that in mind when we go to the calculation method. So you have a lot of interaction and you have a discretization in space and time between factors like presence, heating, ventilation, that do have quite, of course, a, a large influence. Now, if you would take that into to consideration, this were the results from the calculation method, basic like we would do it for energy assessment officially in Belgium. Now, as we know that the ventilation in the living room is ne almost negligible, and also some houses were inhabited, so we had to take into account that the house next to it wasn't heated in the heat balance, so we tried to take all those general aspects into consideration. Meh, not that much of an improvement, but those are general findings. We could go a little bit further and look at, okay, but not everybody heats at the same, in the same way. Here you see box plots of the measured temperatures during one to two representative winter weeks in different households for exterior temperature between zero and five degrees most of the time. And you see the living room and the kitchen, of course, heated the most, but watch the discrepancy between 10 and 32 degrees. And the bedrooms, most of them, remain quite cold between 10 and 15 degrees, with, of course, again, some exception of some people that have difficulties using their electric heaters. But we have to compare that in Belgium, we assume, and that's different, I think, here in Ireland, we assume 18 degrees for the whole house for 24 hours a day. So you could say, OK, it's, yeah, it's in the middle, it's an average, could be OK, but actually not. Because you shouldn't look at the average measured temperature, you should look at the set point temperature. Because the average temperature is a result not only of your setting, but also of the house characteristics. The average depends on how well it's insulated. And this is what I show in this chart for that, this old housing neighborhood. You see here the primary heating set points. And we see heating set points going in the living room, going between 18, and we find some people heating until 28 degrees in the living room. We see people heating for four hours a day, not more. And we see other ones heating for 24 hours a day. So imagine, of course, this tremendous spread. And if we compare that with the assumption, then we see that there's quite a problem. Of course, I'm simplifying. This is for the living room, while the assumption is for the whole house. So I have to be a little bit more careful. Now, let's try to take that into consideration. So what I next did is I, I changed the model. I, I programmed the model myself based on the same method. So it's actually the same formulas, but I made it multi-zone. Uh, really interaction, so um, it's not like two separate zones, but they are an interaction with each other, heat exchange. I inputted a real measured heating set point temperature and a real uh, deduced heating periods. So now I would think, okay, I will, I will get there. We start to get a fit, but we're still not there, not at all. We see that we start to find a correlation between calculated and estimated models, but we still see that most are still using less than 75% of what is assumed. How does that come? I've taken most, the most important factors from user behavior into account. Well, actually, it's not only about all the rooms. I, I, there was a 16 zone models, for example, because I even modeled the, the houses next to it. Actually, you have also default values. But the difference is between this chart and this chart 
is I try to calculate everything a little bit more in detail. For example, in the calculation method, we simplify everything because, I mean, it has to be practical. But single glazing, people assume, okay, single glazing is going to be a U value around, depending on the tables you use, could be five, could be four. But it's actually very dependent on even curtains. In a single window, that might have a considerable influence. System efficiency. If you use it from tables, you have default values, but usually those default values are safe assumptions because, of course, they want you to use the real values to, to do better. They don't want you to use default values that are already that good so that, that, that you won't buy a better unit anymore. This, you don't have only have default values, you have simplified calculation methods. Your heat losses to the floor are simplified methods, so I also looked at research on, on heat losses to the floor, tried to calculate that more in detail, and all those little bits are quite a lot, because if you underestimate, uh, overestimate, for example, to default values, the heat losses, but you also underestimate the efficiency of, of your furnace, it all adds up and multiplies itself. So actually, just by those small simplifications, you explain quite a big gap between reality and theory. Of course, we're not there, and there's still noise, and you could ask yourself, where does that noise come from? Now, we could go one step further and not look at the energy use, but we could look at the indoor temperature, the average. I said in the beginning, you can't implement the measured average temperature because it's a result, not an input. But the calculation method also calculates that average temperature in an intermediate step before it calculates the, the energy use. So I could compare the measured average temperature with the, with the calculated average temperature for each single room in that neighborhood for, of course, the same exterior conditions. And that's why you see here, you have the model temperature on the, uh, underneath, and here you have the, cal uh, the measured temperatures, and you see for the living rooms, the, the green uh, squares, quite a good correlation. Small overestimation in the model, could explain, but won't go into detail. The bedrooms, the crosses, you don't see them well in the charts. We do have quite a good correlation and a small underestimation. I could explain that, but maybe if there's more time for discussion. But the big spreads are located, for example, here, the, the, the triangles, in the bathroom. Some are overestimated, some are underestimated. The same goes for the kitchen. A lot of have higher temperatures, for example, because they, because they cook a lot. And actually, that is very, very hard to take into consideration in those simplified methods. Because the simplified methods are what we call quasi-steady state methods. They assume like they do one calculation per month, like one heat balance, one average. But of course, those are the rooms that you heat, like for example, for 30 minutes while you cook or, or you take a hot shower for 15 minutes. And it's very hard to take that into consideration if you do one calculation, one equation for a whole month, if you are talking about that kind of chart. And those models can't do that. So that, those are limitations. Now, just to give an idea if about the difference between that neighborhood and maybe other neighborhoods. The fact that I mentioned that we are looking at different neighborhoods to see if I could use the same conclusions everywhere. I won't go into detail, just some brief examples. So here we had the previous, the old neighborhood. Here we have the, um, the, the new neighborhood. Now, there is a difference between both. The old neighborhood is a social housing neighborhood. The new neighborhood is privately owned. That means we also have a difference in users. If you look at the age of the users, here you have the, the date of birth. You have in, um, those two fully colored uh, surfaces are Belgian reference data for uh, men and women uh, of the ages. And we see here the old neighborhoods has actually more elder people. You see the new neighborhoods, most of those are born between 1960 and 1980, are young neighborhoods, families. So it's, it's, you can't uh, just take the same data. If you look at the con consequences, for example, on presence, for the old neighborhoods, the red lines, we see that the, the full line is during the week, the dotted line is during the weekend. It's an old neighborhood. We didn't see a lot of differences because we had a lot of retired people, we had a lot of unemployed people, so there wasn't that big difference. If you looked, on the contrary, at the new houses with the young households, then we saw a big difference. A lot of unoccupied living rooms, the dip here during the week, but during the weekend, they were occupied all small bits that makes that you can't just use the same input. And the consequences, of course, the heating. I showed the charts previously with the black dots of heating set points uh, in the old neighborhood. If you look at the new neighborhood, 
um, the blue, the first thing we see is, of course, it's lower here. They heat a lot less, of course, because they're a lot more out of the house during the week. But also, the set point temperature is lower. While well, it's a new house in the living room, you could say, well, it's a new house and it's easier to heat, but let's just heat it. This has partly to do with the difficulty to control it, because it was a gas furnace, so you get like peaks, and, and sometimes it's hotter than you want it to be. But also, it has to do with local discomfort. For example, in the old houses, you have a lot of draft problem. You have like single glazing, you have like the, the, the fact of being in a campfire, you have a hot fire be in front of you, you would, have, you would think it's hot, but still you, you wear something because you have a cold back. It's the idea of having single glazing on one side and a furnace on the other side. Those are kind of local discomforts that you can compensate by higher set point temperatures. That's, those are two of the reasons why we see higher set point temperatures in the old houses. But if you look at the weekends, those blue dots, if you go up, those small arrow bars show the differences between the weekends and the weeks. So when we go to the weekends, it's almost the same. So I think you start to understand that it's really household dependent. So uh, I think as a main conclusions and challenges is you should never underestimate the importance of user behavior, but at the same time, you shouldn't blame everything on the user. First of all, because I mean, he has to use his building, he has to have comfort, but also because there are other causes of discrepancies. Simplifications in the models, simplifications of input values, uncertainties, etc. So we are complex human beings, we have comfort sensation. It's, it's not the same for everyone. Not everyone is comfortable at the same temperature. We have an interaction depending on our, our occupation. We have a changing reality. When we are young and with, with, with children, we will use a building differently than when we are retired. And then the models, they have uncertainty due to the model, but also due to the input. So don't think that the most advanced models we have today are able to give a solution to everything. If you don't know what to input, you still get the wrong results. Applicability is very important. You could go to the oldest complicated model, but you still have to use them as an architect. It's not that easy. So it has to be practical. For example, some people could say, I'm a little bit crazy to do a 16 zone model of a house and, and the neighboring houses. I am, but it still calculates at 0.1 seconds in com comparison to, to the real detailed model. So you still can find an interesting balance between both. And when you go in future to BIM models, when the house is designed in three dimensions, I have a colleague working on that, and you push one button and the, all the geometrical information is sent to a simulation model, it doesn't matter anymore if you calculate one zone or 20 zones. And then, of course, the most important is the validation of the model. And, and that's, I think, what has been the problem until now. We have a model, and everybody uses a model, and everybody assumes it's OK. But you should never use a model before you validate it, and you should validate it for every use of it. It has been designed mainly for new houses. So if you, hold, if you use them also for old houses, and it hasn't been validated for old houses, you're going to have wrong results. That's just the reality of models. Thank you. <laughs>